In this week's episode of the Investors Corner, me, Mike and Ian are getting together to discuss three things you need to know as a landlord. First one being tenant referencing. Now with fraud levels increasing, it's important to know how tenant referencing is carried out and what information a referencing agency gets on that prospective tenant. What tools do they use and how do they minimise the fraud on their end? And how does that differ from them doing it compared to you trying to do it yourself and taking on that risk? Second thing we'll be discussing is a remortgaging process. So Ian will give a case study of what he's just been through remortgaging for his home and is it worth going directly to a lender or getting in contact with a mortgage broker? And we'll also discuss stats. So what this year has done so far in the sales market and in the lettings market too. So make sure that you listen to this one and make sure that you subscribe to the Investors Corner podcast. Ladies, gents, welcome to the Investors Corner podcast. Me, Andy, Mike, full squad for today's episode. We're going to be talking about referencing, what actually happens in referencing. How does a referencing company reference a tenant? What do they go through? What's the criteria? Looking forward to getting stuck into that. I'm going to share a little bit around my remortgage experience on my personal home and the car crash appointment that I had yesterday with uh, a particular <laughs> lender. But I just thought that'd be quite eye-opening for people as things have changed now and obviously rates are changing as well. Um, and we've also got some stats in particular, how many properties that are on the market have currently got a buyer. So do you think, before we get to the answer, that is over or under 50%, Mike will reveal later on in this podcast. But first of all, Andy, how are we doing? First week of Feb? I'm good. I'm bish good. bash bosh, as they say. Yes, yeah, get st- st- stuck straight into this week. Um, lots going on on the letting side of side of the world. So uh, yeah, can't complain. Busy, busy. Mm. We love it. I had a go at um, putting some WD-40 on your chair before this podcast. It's yeah. better, but not quite there. It's not there yet. No. A couple of more touches, though. It'll be, it'll be there. Important to have a recommended tradesperson. Yeah. <laughs> would you say in, in yeah. property management? Absolutely. We'll yeah. dig one out from our contract database. I'm not sure it's worth the call out, if I'm completely <laughs> honest, but we'll move on. No, yeah. I'll just spray the whole can and see what <laughs> happens. I might put a mat down because it's going to get real greasy. Um <laughs> Talk to me about referencing. So I'm always interested to know uh, things change, you know, referencing is something that I would assume must be dynamic, not static in the criteria. As the world evolves, referencing companies must evolve in their criteria for how they look at tenants. But as a, through the eyes of a landlord, what actually, they say, look, referencing's passed, but what's actually been passed? What's the criteria that's been passed? Let's just cover that topic for the listeners so they know that the person that's living in their home that they bought as an investment or accidentally decided to rent, whichever the case may be, but what criteria have they actually passed rather than just that green tick that we visualize? Yeah, well, it's, it's important to get a full understanding of how that tenant is because they're going to be living in your property for the next 12, 18, yeah. 20, 24 months. So there's certain criteria that referencing agencies look at. And the first thing that they look at is um, doing a credit check on that on that tenant. So what we mean by credit check is looking um, to see what rating they are, see if they've got any CCJs, see if they've got any IVAs, uh, IVAs sorry, um, and whether they are financially stable and able to rent that property now certain things could come through for that credit check you know they could have taken out a loan four years ago that helped them purchase something so something like that wouldn't really say that they're a bad tenant just because they got a bad credit rating but things like ccjs and ivas you know in the last six years Mm. if something popped up on their credit file to say that they've got one of those then you would ask questions on, right, what's it for? How long was it ago? And what the amount is. If it, if the amount's £100 because they didn't pay a car parking ticket, mm. which the referencing agency should gather information on that. Or if you employ an agent to rent your property out, they should get that, that evidence as well. Then something like that, it's like, okay, fine. You know, it's just a parking ticket. But we've had cases where... You know, they could ha- have £6,000 CCJ and they could have got into a battle with a company that they owed money to. 
um, or a credit card that they didn't pay off or something like that. So that's when you probably look at it and think, right, hang on a minute, I seriously need to consider who this tenant is. Do I want them in my property? Because they've yeah. got financially in debt previous. How are they going to be paying? That's paying a simple rent? one, isn't it? That's kind of, are you good with money? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. What, so, what else? Um, the other things that you've got is a previous landlord reference. So what the reference and agency should do is get the details for your previous landlord if you were renting previously. Then they should be writing to that landlord or speaking to that landlord to get the information. And that information could be how, how long are they rented for? What rent were they paying? Um, was rent always paid on time? Did they cause any damage to the property? And then what the reference and agency should do is take that information and carry out a land registry check mm -hmm. just to make sure that that person is the actual owner of the property to make sure that that's a genuine person to get the reference from. Because I could be, I could pretend to be a landlord because yeah. it's my mate that's trying to move into the property. I'll call them. Yeah, they were great. And then no additional checks yeah. after that. So that's the importance of getting a professional agency to carry out that reference because they've got the tools to do it to minimize the fraud that comes through. And do they always get that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So yeah, it's part of their criteria because if they come back to us and say that this person has passed and they didn't do those additional checks, then they're not really helping us as a as an agent. Yeah, Yeah. there's interesting nuances around the, the landlord check and the employment check of mm. the email address that they'll accept from a, from a, la from a, from an employer, mm. for example, it can't be a Gmail or a Hotmail. Yeah. It has to be from a registered company domain, mm. which means that it has to come from a registered source and therefore be somewhere where it's traceable as well. Mm. And that's what a good reference company yeah. will do rather than just one who's just, just looking to tick boxes. Mm. Exactly. And it's the same with the with an employment reference as well. So you've got the credit check, you've got the landlord reference, then you've got the employment reference, which again, Exactly the same process, getting the details from the HR department that you, for the company that you work for. The reference and agency will do the check on the email domain. When was it set up? How long has it been registered? Where does it register to? Which company? Um, and then they would call that employer um, as well to verify, to verify the details. They would do a website search on that company as well to find out when the website address was, was set up. Um, just to try and minimize the, the fraud element. I've seen it time and time again. I mean, fraud's gone up around 10% over the last 12 months, mainly in the London area, mm. because obviously you've got property there that's quite you know, expensive to, to rent a property. People can't afford to live there. They can't provide the references. So they go down other routes in, in producing fraudulent, fraudulent documents. Um, but with this reference and agency and having the tools to verify when everything was set up, then that's the power of using the reference and agency because they can do that, which obviously minimizes the fraud that comes through, which then puts your investment at less risk from finding a tenant. Is there a price point where a referencing company is not enough? Is it when we're talking the big ticket stuff, is there a point where more due diligence needs to be done than just a simple referencing company. Yeah, you, I mean, you could do other things on the tenant. You know, you could Google search on the tenant. You can get, you can do open banking with a tenant. So open banking is new technology that's that's sort of propped up on, on the referencing side of things because it gives you access to that person's bank account where you can actually see their salary payments going in. You can see their rental payments going out. Mm -hmm. You can match everything up. And if you're connecting to a bank, then you're not going to be able to fraud to, to fraudulently yeah. produce. Yeah, that, you can't you? produce pay slips out of exactly. an open banking exactly. account. And I think that works for for tenants of all levels yeah. as well, because just applying a simple earnings to to multiples calculator, some people are much better with money than others. Mm. Um, so the open banking side of things can can be used or should be used to prove someone's affordability because it's all very well earning 120 grand a year but if you spend 130 yeah. you're not very well off yeah to be completely honest but if you earn 50k a year and and yeah and 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 live diligently then you're probably a better tenant yeah i think there's there's a lot of push on open banking at the moment because if you do open banking you're able to verify all of that information there and then 
it speeds up the referencing yeah. process massively. I mean, if, if you signed up to Open Banking and you use that as your, your referencing, you could be done within two hours compared mm. to 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So more and more people are uh, becoming used to it. You know, it's just something that other companies do as well now is connect yeah. open banking. So it's definitely that that's the way that it's that it's going. Um, and if it does go that way, then the, the fraud would just reduces. Mm. Interesting. Well, I think from a landlord's point of view, it's just good to know what checks are being done, basically. Yeah, because, you know, landlords that try and do it themselves, they haven't got access to these tools. Mm. You've not even scratched the surface yeah. of the boring stuff, like right to rent, Ian. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, How deep are we going? Yeah. Not we'll, that deep. We're not that deep. We'll leave that for another time. Um, but, yeah, landlords don't have access to tools. You know, I've spoken to landlords before where they've got a written reference that's been sent to them, and that's it. Mm. they've taken as that must be okay they haven't even made the call to the employer to verify that information and what happens 12 months later tenant doesn't pay rent tenants uh, tenants damage the property and then they wonder why they're in that situation well yeah no, nothing, less, do, nothing so. less reliable than a previously written reference yeah, being it's just me it's, to, it's worth yeah, nothing yeah. Mm. It's, it's worth nothing nowadays what what is the multiple these days is it still 30 times for for the kind of simplistic calculation that yeah the agencies still use 30 times that we've talked about it before that it's probably around 33 percent of your income now that's being spent on on rent but yeah they're, they're still doing 30 30 times a bit more for a guarantor you know, if a guarantor is needed, then you assume they need 36, 37, because you'd assume that they have their own mortgage to pay, their mm -hmm. own bills to pay. So they need to earn more just in case that, that tenant gets into trouble. So, just to explain the 30 times for anyone that's listening that doesn't know what that is. So 30 times the monthly rent. Yep. So yeah. So Equals their salary. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah if your rent's £1,000 a month, your minimum basic guaranteed salary needs to be 30 k a year. Yeah. And that's as a combined household as, as well. So you could have two people in there, both earn 15 k each. Mm -hmm. As long as it meets the 30 times the monthly rent, that's enough to, to satisfy the, the referencing agency. But like you say, same when you're doing a mortgage, what they want to know is okay, you earn X, but how much do you spend? And what's the void? Yeah, what's the gap between? And that's a, a sensible thing to check as well, really, isn't it? Yeah, as a landlord, as an agent, I'm more interested in that, because mm. it's all very well, like I say, earning a high amount of money. But if you've got a ranger over on the drive, you've also got high outgoings as well. Yeah, mm. exactly. So yeah, th those, are, those are the main things. Like I said, there's other things that you can do, like Google searches and all of that sort of stuff, which I tend to do now and then, you know, something comes back from the reference and agency that's not quite clear mm -hmm. or that's right on the edge, then I'll go away and do, and do my own check. research. Yeah. You know, it's get, like we just said, getting employment references or getting bank statements or anything like that is pointless nowadays. You can go onto Google, type in bank statement, and you'll find all of these websites that pop up. Yeah literally a template for the bank statements and they input all of the information. You know, I remember back in the days when I was in London, used to get bank statements, bank statements, bank statements sent through. And there was a few clued up fraudulent people out there. Other ones, you'd get a statement saying bonking statement or your bonk statement. I was wondering where that was statement. going. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd have direct debits going out on a Sunday, which does not happen. You'd have IBAN numbers that don't match the account number in the sort code. Mm. So it's things like that. We used to get people still takes an educated that. eye to know yeah. to check the bank statement for a direct debit that yeah. goes out on a Sunday. It's a good tip if yeah. you're ever checking a bank statement for those yeah, it's Chinese true. replicas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. So yeah, there's things out there, but yeah, uh, my advice: just get it professionally done. Yeah, the world of fraud mm. is is scary. How evolved and how advanced it is now, especially with yeah. AI and you know, voice recognition and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's scary. It's quite scary. So you do have to be very, very sure and trusting in the process that's going on. And I think that is why it is good to know about what type of referencing company it is that you use as an agency mm -hmm. and what is the process they go through. How do the referencing companies differ across, you know, the industry? Is there a significant difference? Does one do A and one do B? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's good for landlords to understand that. Is there a drastic difference in, in the referencing agencies, you know, across the, across the industry? I'm sure there's a few yeah. like go to that agents use, but I mean, the majority of them, the, the, the big ones out there do the same sort of process and do the same sort of checks. But you'll still have ones out there where you can get a basic check done for a couple of quid. Mm. 
and you know it lists all of these things that it gets but they won't go to the depth of the other what the other agencies do because they can't for a couple of quid you know if we're talking about land registry check that's three quid already you know if we're talking about open banking and connecting all that and the time that's needed to do that it's going to be more than a couple of mm. couple of quid yeah so, same goes for id documents you need yeah. them run through a, a document checking program because with all due respect i've been on a course of how to mm. identify a fake passport but it shouldn't be my job no to sit there like any like like i'm at heathrow terminal three checking mm. people's passports yeah. to check if there's the right num number of numbers along the bottom for a namibian passport like mm. Mm. there's probably 13 different variations of the same passport that yeah. needs to be done professionally and it's not always done by a reference company. yeah and that's going on to the right to rent check right is that you've got the visa you've got the passport you need to be made aware of what to look for if you're doing it yourself if you use a referencing agency they're going to run it through that software so it's going to tell you whether it's fraudulent or or not if you're trying to do it yourself you know I've, I've got a sheet that i use where you input the numbers at the bottom of the passport sheet and it will tell you the last you know you get the last digit on your passport mm -hmm. so it'll tell you what that digit should be so the amount of people that i've caught out before with the wrong digit on the end really yeah mm. but everything else looks fine it's that last digit on the end because it works out what country it's from with your date of birth with your passport number and that's what gives you the last and what are they the trying to digit. do what? what were they trying to do when you caught them out? What was the plan? Uh, well, they I think they're trying to be in the UK. Yeah, they're to... <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah. So, yeah, it's just trying to illegally rent. But when you put, you know, when you say, look, unfortunately, you know, we can't can't rent to you. We, mm. I used to not disclose the information to them because I used to have to report it to, to Action Fraud and then they'll catch up with them at, at some point. Mm -hmm. um, a few of them, though, I called out on and then, yeah, literally never heard from them again. The, la the, last, the last one I had, <laughs> this is a true story. The last one I had, I rang, I, my reference company called me and said, Mike, you've accepted a fake passport, fake Belgian passport. I was like, okay. Um, I was like, funnily enough, the guy dropped it in. He was like, and I rang him and said, look, we're not going to rent the property to you because it's a fake passport. And he said, can I come in and have the passport back? <laughs> <laughs> did he come in <laughs> he was he was willing to come in and and i rang the police the police were across the road from the branch i was working in they didn't care no so there's literally no. nothing all i could all I, all i know is he probably moved into a different yeah. house down the street with somebody else just wasn't one probably of my did. landlords so I, I kicked the can away from us but unfortunately there was no greater power to actually say yeah i, could, I can get him in at two o'clock yeah, do you want to chat? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not a minor on a thing. plate, it's a fake like, passport, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, baffling. Good story. Yeah. How's uh, how's the month started? Lettings overall. I mean, it seems like it's been pretty hectic. Are we seeing any ease on rents at the moment, or is the rents? No, do just... you know what? It's 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 a busy start to the year. Normally, you're still sort of quiet, aren't you, in these in these months? But for us, I mean, we had a record break in Jan. Mm. Um, you know, going into February. You know, doing lots of valuations, properties coming on. Where are those valuations? What's the source? Is it people doing let to buys? Is it people, are they just legitimate investments, so, new investments, old investments? Yeah, the majority of the valuations that have come through are people moving overseas mm, or I've first timers. It, yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of them. I, don't, I think I've only spoken to one landlord that rents the property currently. Mm. The rest are first timers really so yeah but a lot of overseas Good for the lot yeah we've got overseas. we've got one going to belgium we've got one going to australia Fake i spoke passport. to someone yeah. this morning going to dubai all on british passports okay yeah um <laughs> i can't tell you i didn't yeah. check to be completely honest i presume they are a lot of people going to dubai yeah big benefits housing market out there is absolutely popping mm. i'm told records being broken month on month in in there is a huge economy um speaking to a mortgage broker yesterday He's desperate to move there, but the FCA won't let him. Really? Can't run his company from from out of the UK mm. um, because of of their own their own world. But stats on lettings, I've got the stats, oh, so I can I can prove whether you've just said is um, is is right or wrong. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not your feeling. <laughs> year on year, first of January till till today, 
uh, last year in the RG and GU postcodes as a whole. So a good swathe of the southeast. 2,866 properties let last year. 2,911 this year, so a 1% increase. Pretty stable. Rents last year average 1,525. This year average rent 1,690 pounds. Uh, year on year increase of almost 11 percent another wow. double digit mm. big increases it is a big increase isn't it what was the quick calculation on the pounds and pence difference there uh 165 that's that's a big, a big jump yeah price of the bag of shopping at tesco's <laughs> yeah. yeah not far off yeah it's mm. a big increase isn't it 11 11 percent i mean what do, what do we think that's going to happen this this year because the reports are saying that the rental inflation will come down slightly around sort of five or five or six percent on the sales side of things obviously with mortgage rates essentially coming down swap rates as as well do you think more and more people will be able to buy a property this year compared to compared to last year i just wonder whether there is a different type of mean property these days i just wonder whether we are seeing more families doing like what you just spoke about more families uprooting and going to dubai are we seeing more four bed townhouses four bed detached houses three bed sammies more family homes being let in today's yeah. climate than we would have experienced five years ago three years ago even 10 years ago where it was a very dominant one bed two bed market for rentals yeah. in 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 probably 80% of the, the rents in the southeast. So I just wonder whether that's having an impact on the prices, whether it's it's not relative to the actual calculation that's needed to show it. You know, what is a four bed versus a four mm. bed price mm. change? What is a three bed versus a three yeah. bed semi price change? So that's what I wonder. It's the classic kind of with when you see the right move statistics on new listing prices, you know, and they talk about average house prices and they talk about it the month after the Easter term or the summer holidays, where obviously house prices go up every single time mm. in May and every single time in September, because all the family homes come on. The prices mm -hmm. haven't gone up. It's just the change in yeah. type mm. of property that's been listed. So I, I'm wondering whether that is what's happening with those numbers, because I, I don't I don't think rental prices have done that for the last three years in a row, but the stats would say they have. Mm. But I just wonder whether it's there's more threes and fours than ones not than ones and twos but in an equivalent to where it was previously that's that's the question that i'd like to know the I'll answer see if to. we can pull them for next week we'll get it we'll bring it to you we can do oh, anything i think, I think, they, I think they have mm. i think prices have done that across the board which is now showing your average middle of the road three bed terrace is is 16.90 in our area i think that's mm. bang on the money yeah um and i think April is D Day for uh, for the increase on national minimum wage, and that releases the bottom of the market another ten percent increase this year. Mm. And if the bottom of the market goes up ten percent, well then the two beds go up ten percent, yeah. and the three beds go up by ten percent, and etc. It's like a domino mm. effect. So I can reason me confidently with a bit of research and a bit of brain behind it. Say there's no reason it doesn't do the same thing again, and we end up with seventeen something next year. Or even eighteen. Cool. We will see. We'll see. We'll see. That's Mike's forecast. Record that. Can lock happen. it. <laughs> stick it in a bank. Play it in twelve months' time. We'll see what we'll see what happens. It's yeah, um, it's got a habit as well of telling the future. Remember what you said about mortgage rates in a previous mm -hmm. podcast episode we've indeed. done? Yeah. We got it right. Well yeah, done. Indeed. Well, with, with mortgage rates, I think for the first time in the best part of nine months, I think we saw just a little change on the swap rates a little tick upwards mm. little tick upwards couple of just increases i went to do my uh remortgage i've got six months until my fixed term is up um on my residential house which is scary because i've got 1.52 percent oh. interest rate on that at the moment it's a fairly lumpy mortgage you know on the family home and i think um the key thing that i've experienced with that is when you think about rates at two year versus five year fixed, and everyone's kind of, you know, a lot of brokers are saying, you know, the five year market is where the money is. The margins and the difference were were minimal. Negligible, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely yeah. minimal. You know, we're talking 2% difference, you know, not in the rate, but in the actual amount that I would pay back mm. monthly. Um, obviously the mortgage 
is going up significantly. You know, for me personally, it's probably going to be the best part of 800 quid more on my mortgage per month, you know, so it's a sizable amount, but it was looking like it was going to probably be about 12, 13, 1400 yeah. more at one point when they were all around the sixes. But it was, it was interesting because when I bought my house, it was in need of fixing up. It had been left stagnant for kind of three years without being lived in. And it was all the original stuff from 25 years prior to that when it was built. And I've then spent X amount of money on it. And I said to Halifax, the, the lender, I was like, look, we've done 80 odd grand's worth of work over the last kind of three or four years on the property. I don't think the valuation is just based on that mm. because they're taking it from the price I bought it for, which I totally understand the, the mathematics of it, which then meant I moved from being an online customer into I now need to have an appointment, a Zoom call with someone. I had a 90 minute Zoom call with someone yesterday from Halifax and it was all geared up around, they wanted every bit of information. What age am I retiring at? <laughs> they wanted to know obviously about different uh, life cover, how I plan to pay the mortgage off. Um, and a lot of the reasons why they were asking for that information was so that they could give me the right advice at the end of the call. I didn't receive any advice on that call. I didn't need advice for, yeah. for starters, but I didn't <laughs> just want the best rate. <laughs> yeah. What, just, yeah. what rate are you going to give the rate? Me? <laughs> but I actually didn't receive any advice on it. And I just thought the whole experience, you know, for, for going direct, you know, cause I wanted to see, I wanted to fix it direct. I won't go direct by the time uh, the actual final rate comes up, unless this is the best rate that mm. I can get within the next six months. Cause I'm fixing it early with a view of, being then in control the yeah, yeah being in control but it was the difference of that the price that my house is worth um in comparison to what they'd given was the difference between being on a 60 loan to value and a 75 percent loan to value effectively um and it only needed to go up like 20 grand to make it work and even though i'd spent the 80 grand they couldn't do that calculation in their underwriting so i had to do an hour-long appointment they then have to take the information of uh, what refurbishment work we've done on the house. They then have to give that to someone who's then going to do another desktop thing. They're then going to ask me for photos to show photos that the windows have been done, the garden's been done, the kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. For them to then potentially come back and say they might need to go around and check the property. I can give an amazing website which just tells them a fence, fence, it's been registered with fencer. I mean, what? It a is... photo. I mean, I'll give you a photo of my, my window. How are you going to prove that is your window? Just take, off, just take it straight off Google Images. Jesus. You know, it, is, it, was, it was really, really archaic. But I think for me, it does just truly show, and we're not plugging particular mortgage advisors here, but it does truly show the value that you get from dealing with a mortgage advisor because the chances are, that I probably won't end up doing the remortgage with Halifax because they're about 0.4% off the best rates out there. And I needed to do that for the fixed term, but it's probably an hour and a half wasted, plus the phone call that I had before where I shifted from the app to the telephone to mm. the online, blah, blah, blah. Um, because if you have that conversation with a broker, you pretty much have that conversation once and then they do yep. the legwork for yeah. you. And you know, I think a lot of people do go direct and do that and it's fine if you're happy to just go and refix with that lender straight off the mm -hmm. bat and you can click a button and do it and you're happy with the valuation etc but when it gets a little bit more complex and you have you know spent x amount of money on your property and you do look at the loan to value change then that's obviously something that i would just share with people to say look just have a chat with a broker do it that way it's it's much easier some of those brokers get better deals i already know mm. a broker that mm. can get a better deal with the halifax than the halifax can offer me which yep. in its own meanwhile right, the halifax are paying them 0.4 yeah. percent commission as well so it's you just, know it's a lose lose it, but it, it is, is what it is yeah it's absolutely bonkers but that's the way it is the thing for me that would be interesting to get your your guys thoughts and obviously this is not advice we're not mortgage advisors but you know, what are we thinking in terms of two year versus five years? If there's not much in it, you know, we're talking a grand a year saving if I went with a five year, but then I'm committed to five years. Yeah. You know, what, oh. do, what do we think? To flip it. Let's pretend it's a it's a buy to let and not my residential. But, you know, what, what would we think if someone just asked you down the pub for that, that bit of information? Because I've yeah. got my view, but I'm interested to know what you guys I think. I mean, if it was me, I'd always go shorter term rather than longer term but, it, but again it comes back to what's your goal with that property so if you've got the buy to let property and you know for the next 10 years 
I'm, I'm not going to do anything with it. That is just going to be rented out. Yeah. And that, that is the sole purpose to do that. Then you would fix it in for, mm. for, for longer. But you know, if you if your goal is shorter term, then yeah, two year fix. You know, I I would always do two year fix, whether it's residential or buy to let, because I'm at that stage in my life where I don't know where I'm going to be in two, two years. years. Time, Something yeah. might come up. You don't know, say that, Andy. <laughs> I'm not, but I'm not. I'm not <laughs> yeah. in my. I'm not in my last family home. Yeah. So I know that I'm going to move. You, you might know, want the cash. Might, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Might want the cash. Um. To Dubai with a fake Belgian passport. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is my goal. That is on my <laughs> dreams right there. It's yeah. like iPhone notes bucket list. <laughs> Can I make this work? Yeah. In Dubai, maybe you could. I don't know. Yeah, um, but yeah, that, well, I, mean, I wouldn't turn up to Dubai with a fake passport. Yeah, it's no. not. That's as far as police go, probably last, not one to mess around with. That'll be the last place I go <laughs> to do anything dodgy. Um, but yeah, that that's just me at my time right right now. But like I said, if you're a seasoned landlord and your game is investing in property then you would fix it in but you never know what's around the corner something could happen in this world tomorrow mm. where yeah it changes everything yet we, again really we don't interesting know if, point rates, of view. if rates bottomed out or not we don't know do yeah we? that's the thing no, you, you'll never know that till it happens yeah. it's an interesting point of view because um probably five years ago i fixed a buy to let for five years got a great deal um and then ended up selling it after three years and paying a redemption penalty mm. because I wanted to buy my forever family mm. home mm. and it was the best way to raise finance was to take the 100k out of one of the buy to lets and take the pain of the of the redemption penalty so curveball new mortgage was launched this week five year fixed no redemptions after two yeah. years mm. so it's like a you called it a break clause mortgage didn't yeah. you um, <laughs> really which is. yeah which was an it the rate wasn't the best but it's it's a first dip of the market of someone saying look we'll fix the rate for five years because we believe in the rate mm -hmm. but we'll, we will give you the flexibility that you want because the reason i fix long term is because i hate paying arrangement fees mm. and if i'm redoing my mortgage which i will be by october just like you i'll be going on a long-term rate because i'm looking at the two rates being basically the same couple of quid out and I'd rather pay a thousand pounds once than a thousand pounds now, a thousand pounds in two years, and a thousand pounds again in four years' time to fix twice whilst I'm sat on a fixed rate. So I'm thinking I'm saving over two thousand pounds in arrangement fees by just doing it once. But on the buy to let, I got stung. Mm. My resi, I don't, I don't really care to be honest, because if I ever move again, which I have no plan on doing, I'll just port the mortgage. This this yeah. was this was on that point. This was quite interesting what she said as well because she she was asking me about the fixed and she said if we had a one year fixed product, is it something you'd be interested in? And I said, do you have a one year fixed product? And she said, no. And Give me one point five percent. I'm interested. <laughs> and I said, I said, have you got a one year fixed product coming? And she said, maybe. I couldn't tell you if we did. And I was like, it was just an interesting yeah. question. And then it's I, a gambler's product. Yeah. Afterwards, I calculated it in my head, like just looking at it analyt analytically. Why is that a tick box question that Halifax advisors mm. are now asking? And then you've got to look at it and say, obviously, because they're thinking it's of market launching research. Product. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if they are thinking of launching a one year fixed product, are they thinking that because they know something about what's going to happen mm. in the market over the next 12 months that we don't? So are they looking at that as a way of saying, do a one-year fixed because rates will be better in a year's time? Or are they doing it because they're thinking, well, we can screw a few people. I was say, why, would, why, why would they do that for their yeah. customers? Um, yeah. It's a weird one because they're giving value in five years, but also thinking about introducing one-year mortgages. Yeah. It's like... There's two very different trains of thought in the same bank. Mm. I got mm. nothing. No. Interesting. No. Well, you know, it was an experience nonetheless. I'm glad I did it. It wasted, <laughs> yeah. it wasted an hour, uh, an hour and a half in the end, actually. But it was quite interesting to kind of just see how that experience went because the last 10 years I've always used a broker and mm -hmm. um, that was just quite interesting to see how they did it direct and 
very archaic, very interesting. Tried to play me a video at the beginning with all of the T's and C's. The video didn't work because I hadn't downloaded some software that was in the email because they sent the email to the wrong email address. Um, but other than that, it was fun. So you spent, so that time. So, spent... so someone else that's somewhere <laughs> yeah. in the UK is currently remortgaging using your detail. Yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> they just, they actually just sent it to my personal email. Okay, the email. all right, we're safe. Not, no, not we're... the wrong like, typed email, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But that's the reason why brokers are there, right? To make that process simpler. Yeah. They take, they do all the legwork. There's no need for them. They wouldn't be here. And I think people just sometimes find it, e- find it easier just to click that bu- button, like you said, mm. not have to go through additional checks or, or whatever, things like that. But yeah, brokers, brokers a bit of a no brainer, really. Yeah. Because well, they've just know. got access to everything rather than just speaking to Halifax where it's just their, their products. Do you want another fact? Do you want another fact? Hit me with sales. Right, we've hit lens. Let's let's hit sales again. RG and GU postcodes, twenty twenty three versus twenty twenty four year to date. One sorry, two thousand seven hundred and sixty three properties have been sold in comparison to two thousand four hundred and forty two. That is an increase of thirteen percent houses under offer this year, year to date. Um, Also. 48% 48% of the houses sold this year have been reduced as opposed to 57% last year. Mm. So 9% less reductions. Interesting. Average price. I'm going really deep now, aren't I? Mm. 533K. So £533,000 average price, RG and GU, wow. as opposed to 550 last year. So okay. a price drop okay. of 4%. So cutting through all the Twitter BS of... Uh, market crashes and this that and the other more houses are selling this year at a slightly more reasonable price Mm. never has such a headline been so dull discuss (laughs) (laughs) well i mean it's it's what people want there's a bit more stability there isn't there you know more properties are selling uh properties don't need to be reduced as frequently as they were previously we have seen we've got more properties under offer I think more properties coming to the market as well is the other statistic that we saw in January. And I just feel sorry for the people that have listened to the donuts that were forecasting these horrible market crashes that were going to happen in 2023 that were causing buyers to withdraw out of fear on some really good interest rates. And we don't know what fixed terms they were going to be, but they were on really good interest rates at two, two and a half percent, you know, in homes that would have got them on the ladder in a very cheap monthly mortgage. And they withdrew because these donuts on TikTok and Twitter and other places were trying to spout some agenda that never happened. And we said it wasn't going to happen and it didn't happen. And as a result, you've got buyers that, could have got really good deals and you've got sellers that lost buyers at good prices because the buyers were getting good deals. So everyone lost money. Mm -hmm. The market obviously wasn't supported by it in terms of the transaction period, but the people lost money because people had this engagement agenda and it's a shame that it happened. And we tried to warn people about it, but bad news does sell and that's the world we're in. And unfortunately people, that are in sales or are able to tell a story with confidence, even if it's not factual, are able to change people's perspective on the Mm. market. And that's pretty much what happened 14 months ago, 15 months ago. So those stats, by the way, direct off 20 CI, the UK's leading collector of statistics. Yeah. So, you know, for a fact check, if anyone yeah. was interested in claiming or calling us out, <laughs> little, little star at the bottom. Yeah. Of the small <laughs> but that, that's where it is. And I think that's, that's the market that we'll see. We won't see interest rates at the start of the year at six and a half percent average. And then at the end of the year at four and a half percent average, they're around four and a half percent or whatever they are now. It won't be that drastic two percent swing in December this year. There'll probably be half a percent in it some way or another. Mm. In terms of uh, price changes, you know, we're talking about 19 grand's worth of price change on the average house price there in the U- in, in the kind of RGGUs, roughly um, 13. Yeah, 17,000 drop, which is 17, 4%. 000. Yeah, 4%. Yeah. You know, 4%, that's not, it's not a big swing. And the land registry says about 2%. Well, I mean, ironically, you're talking about, you know, people being done by not buying at the right time and the right interest rate. I've probably paid not far off that 
off my mortgage since interest rates went up because I'm sat on a re- on a on a decent fixed rate anyway. Mm-hmm. So I've I've sat in my property, it's probably lost some value, but my mortgage has been paid down by the amount it's lost. So yeah. I'm no further backwards and haven't paid anyone any rent, which has gone up by ten percent in the yeah. last year. So I'm I'm winning still. And I think it's always important for people that talk about that headline number, price changes, this, that and the other. People don't ever, ever buy a property because of the price it's on at. It never happens. You never buy a property because of the price it's on at. You buy a property because of what you're able to afford. Mm. And then you go and find the property that's on at the price you can afford and buy it at the price that you can afford. No one goes, I want to buy a house at 600. They go, what can I afford monthly? And what does that mean I get lent by the bank? 575. And then you go and buy a house at 575 because that's what you can afford. And that is the key part when we're talking about these interest rates and these monthly changes, which people misunderstood when they were given this fear factor kind of narrative about a market crashes. That was, ironically, the phrase back then, the cheapest day to buy a property. Even though the prices have changed, it was still cheaper for you to buy the property then. because It was cheaper monthly and you could have done your overpayment. You could have done X, Y and Z. And yeah, to answer your question long-windedly, without any passion clearly in my voice about it. <laughs> I'm not bothered. Uh, don't listen to those donuts on TikTok that are talking, you know. Yes, yeah, so follow Avocado that... Ian on TikTok, followed by about 12,000 people with a million <laughs> likes. Um, yeah. Does for the, for does, facts. <laughs> <laughs> does that translate to landlords, that theory that people don't buy a property because of the price of what it's on at? Obvious, obviously, that translates exactly to your family home buyer or your first time buyer does that translate as straightforward and black and white to a landlord well i think the calculation extends because it's what's the rent what's the monthly cost to mm-hmm. the landlord how much profit will i make monthly is my goal to make money profit monthly or is my goal in equity on a long term basis how quickly can i pay the mortgage off if i'm doing it with a mortgage am i buying it cash with a goal for it to finance a retirement or something else The calculation obviously extends into about five different buckets, but in answer, yeah, still the same thing. You know, if I'm buying a property at 250 today because it cash flows monthly and it makes sense versus something else that I'm looking at in that calculation, it all comes down to what is that long-term goal or what is that monthly goal really? But the price, the 250 is the least relevant out of all mm. of those numbers that I'm looking at because I want to know what's the growth projection you know what was it worth 10 years ago what it potentially been worth 10 years time how much monthly profit do I make and does it work on my spreadsheet because it's more of a transaction it's more of a mathematical yeah. calculation than, a, than an empathy purchase really so yeah, yeah. You've probably even more so really but no one mm. and I'd argue it till I'm blue in the face but no one ever buys a property because of the price it's on for just that's not the first step it's it's mathematics and calculations that are done before that that you then go and buy the property that's in your price range on a month monthly affordability. So. I cannot wait to see the argument in the comments. I'm here for it. Yeah. The only I reason can, someone I would can, I, I can see a few comments the, coming. The only reason why through. someone would is if they're downsizing, freeing up money with a retirement. Because you plan. have to. Yeah. And I'm saying yeah. I want to. Re- but even then, I need to release 300k. And that's the mover not the price you're buying the property mm. for. So it's yeah. still, even though I'm counter-arguing myself, still I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bomb that's show. It. That's the end. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week, gang. Why have we made the Investor's Corner podcast, Ian? I think online at the moment, there is just way too much noise, waffle and nonsense. Everyone's got an agenda. So the goal was to make a podcast for people that want to invest money in property or other areas where there's no waffle, there's no nonsense, there's no agenda. It's opinion-led, but it's an honest opinion. And it might not be the right answer, but we're going to share it. So on the podcast, we're going to supply people with access to mortgage brokers, financial advisors, planning experts, development consultants, everything around the property industry and the wider fields. Yeah, so if you're looking at investing in the future, you know that just having an income from your employer or from your business is not enough to give you the life that you want down the line, we're going to hopefully give you some of those answers that will give you the solutions you need for the future. So please hit the subscribe button. The more subscribers we get, the better guests that we can get on and the more people that we can reach. So hit subscribe.